So I told you I'm, I'm kind of changing the slide so that I'm minimizing the overlap from the previous presentation to this one. So no recap, no nothing. So continuing from there, right? So we now talk about uh, what we mean by locality sensitive hash families, right? LSH families of hash functions. Um, <coughs> so really, if you think of what the hash functions are doing for us here, right? It's essentially taking two elements x and y, right? And telling us if they are similar enough for us to be a candidate for comparison, right? So really, that is what we want from this hash function, right? So if you say the two functions hash to the same value, it means that h says yes for these to be similar elements, right? Therefore, we need to have these hash functions somehow intimately tied with the distance metric that we are using. Right? So, the hash functions have to be intimately tied with the distance metric that we are using and that is why they are called locality sensitive hashing. So, they are basically aware of the way the data points are embedded in the metric space whichever you are considering for them. Right? So, that is very important. Right? And so, we, so these hash functions always are tied in with the distance uh, measure that we use. And we say that uh, uh, a family of hash functions H is said to be D1, D2, P1, P2 locality sensitive hash, right? We, we call it D1, D2, P1, P2 sensitive if it satisfies the following two conditions. If the distance between X and Y is less than or equal to D1, right? Then the probability that HX equal to HY over all H, right? taken over all h is at least p1 right if i randomly sample a h and have them hash right the probability that i'll get hx equal to hy is at least p1 okay if the distance is less than or equal to d1 likewise if the distance is greater than d2 right then the probability that hx equal to hy is at most p2 okay so obviously it goes without saying that D1 is less than or equal to D2, right? That is the typical condition that we want. So, we, we expect D1 to be less than or equal to D2 and, uh, and uh, so if D1 is less than, I mean D is less than D1, then we want the probability to be at least P1, right? And D is greater than D2, then we want the probability to be upper bounded by P2, okay? So, let us go back, so it is something like this, right? So, I have two, two uh, thresholds D1 and D2. So, if my distance is less than D1, the probability should be P1 or greater, right? So, what is the y axis? It is the same thing that we had earlier. So, the x axis is the similarity between the data points and the y axis is the probability that you will declare them to be equal, right? They will declare them in, in the previous case, you will declare them as a candidate pair. In this case, the hashes will be equal. Right? And if it is greater than D2, then the probability is at most P2, it is bounded by P2 or lower, or, right? So, what about the in-between region? So, when you, when you characterize this family of hash functions, you typically do not specify anything about the in-between region, right? But then most hash functions or there are construction techniques, right? The, I'd allow you to move D1 and D2 pretty close, right, while retaining the guarantees on P1 and P2. So, if I give you one family of hash functions which satisfy this uh, D1, D2, P1, P2 guarantee, then there are ways of constructing, you know, derived families that will move D1, D2 closer, right, while, you know, pushing P1, P2 farther away. But typically, there is no nothing that is said about what happens between D1 and D2. Makes makes life a little easier for us. Okay. So let's go back and look at our jacquard distance uh, hash function. Right. So we had this. Right. The probability that the two two hash values are same was equal to the similarity of x and y. Right. So jacquard similarity converting into jacquard distance, it's one minus similarity. Okay. 
So, uh, um, so it is 1 minus distance here, right? Because similarity is what we had earlier. So, the probability h s equal to h y is 1 minus the distance of x comma y, right? So, the claim, I mean there are many ways you can state this claim, right, for the uh, 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 min hatching family that we looked at. Um, so, it is a one third, three fourths, two thirds, one fourth sensitive family. So, what do I mean by that? If the distance is less than one third, then the probability the min hash values agree is greater than two thirds. Correct? So, that is basically how it is, right. And likewise, if the distance is greater than three fourths, then the probability that the min hash value agrees is lesser than one fourth. Okay, so we have this guarantee from the min hash construction, right? I'm not talking about the the B and R bands, right? And the B bands of R R rows. We are not talking about that yet. I'm just talking about the single hash function construction. Okay. So the min for Jacquard similarity generalizing min hashing gives us a D1 D2 1 minus D1 1 minus D2 sensitive family for any D1 and D2. That is where we are. Next, what we did was using this bands idea, right, to take this weak LSH family. But that is a pretty weak guarantee. What we gave was a pretty weak guarantee. If you are looking for one third similarity, right, and then uh, you get a probability of two thirds, right. So, that is not a great, great guarantee, right. But what we, uh, what we are going to do is uh, basically look at what we call as an amplifying technique, right. The idea is still to use, you know, whatever we did earlier, right. So, and and or construction is what we are going to call it. So, and is like the rows in the band, right. So, every row had to agree. So, that is an and construction or is like across the bands, right. One of the bands has to agree, right. So, there is an and construction and an or construction. So, what does the AND construction do for us, right? Now, look at that. So, if H is D1, D2, P1, P2 sensitive, then H prime that I form by taking the AND of R different <coughs> has functions will be D1, D2, P1 power R, P2 power R. Nothing very deep about it, right? This is basically because all the hash functions are independent. Right. So, the good thing is, so you remember what is the P2 guarantee we have? He said if something is far enough, then the probability that it will hash together is P2, right. Now, it is P2 power R, so the probability is reduced. So, that is good. But unfortunately, it also lowers the probability for the P1 side of things. So, the probability is going to go down, okay. So, when you do an AND construction, you are getting better at eliminating false positives, right. We are getting better at eliminating false positives because you have now reduced the probability that large distances will hash to the same value, right. But at the same time true positives also go down, right. So, false negatives can go up. So, we look at what happens with the oring part of it, right. So, in the R what happens? So, if I have a D1, D2, P1, P2 family to begin with, if I take members from that family and OR it, right. So, ORing means for some i they have to agree, not for all i, right. For any one i they agree or fine. Then if you remember our construction earlier, so 1 minus P1 is a probability that it would not agree, right, uh, uh, for one of those hash functions. 1 minus P1 power B is it would not agree on all of those hash functions. 1 minus that is basically your probability that will agree on at least 1, right. So, now again this raises the probability for small distances. If P1 is small, 1 minus 1 minus P1 power B will be large, right. Uh, I am sorry, it just makes it larger. Whatever it is, it makes it larger, but it also raises the probability for the large distances. Same thing happens, right. So, P2 now gets amplified. So, your false positives go up. Okay. Uh, but your true positives also go up. So, that is a good thing. So, now what you can do is you can make various combinations of AND and R. Right. If you think about what we did with our R bands and uh, I mean B bands and R rows per band, 
how did we what did we do how did we combine the or and and there sorry sorry I, again I, I, i'm not allowed to move closer to you to listen to what you're saying so you have to talk louder yeah we did so but then we did and and or right so what how, how did we combine this we did, we did an and first and created a new family of hash functions which was an and of the min hashes right and so we created many such uh, examples from that family of and of min hashes so remember when you do an and right so i am creating a new family of hash functions which are d1 d2 p1 power r p2 power r sensitive right so i created a new family of hash functions by doing and and then i did an or to create this d1 d2 1 minus 1 minus p1 power b 1 minus 1 minus p2 power b so i did this so i first did an and of r and then i did a or of those anded families right so we can basically do this different kinds of construction so we can first do an and and or which is what we did alternatively you could have done an or and then do an and right see what do you do if you doing an or and an and so you done the banding right then what you do you look at the first band you have or rows if any one of them hash into the same bucket you say that that band has hashed it into the same bucket you get that and then now all the 20 bands will have to hash it to the same bucket for you to say that they are truly similar that is the anding part so you or first by saying each one of those five that you are considering if any one of them has the same hash value then you say that band itself has hashed it into the same value but now across the 20 bands all 20 bands have to hash it to the same bucket for you to declare them as a candidate pair so this is first you or and then you and but you might not want to choose the 5 and 20 if you are oring first okay you might want to choose 10 and 5 so or or 10 and 10 how are you like so you have to play around with this b and r to figure out what is the right number for you right and you can actually take any combination you can or and then and and then or and then and you'll keep pushing these you know the upper and lower transitions uh, uh, different right so let's see what happens to the uh, the yes curve right <coughs> so let's take h i'll construct h bar by anding with r equal to 4 okay this is different numbers so we did we did 5 and 20 but we are doing doing 4 and then from h prime i'm going to construct h double prime by r construction with b equal to 4 right this is basically what we did so that we get 1 minus p power 4 the whole power 4 so it takes basically transforms a 0.2 0.8 0.8 0.2 sensitive family right what does that mean it seems that if the distance is 0.2 or lesser then the probability i'll hash it together is 0.8 or higher right i'll take that family and convert that into a 0.2 0.8 0.8785 and 0.0064 sensitive family. So it's not. I've not improved the higher end by a whole lot, but the lower end from 0.2 has now gone to 0.0064. So if they are at 0.2, or basically other way around, if they are 0.8 apart, right? If the distance is at least 0.8 apart, then I would the probability of hashing them into the same bucket is 0.0064. Okay, so that's good, right? Now let's look at the or and composition. so first i do an or and then an and so basically my thing is going to look like that correct earlier it looked like uh really no okay so they they have the same numbers here uh so it shouldn't be right yeah okay so this is 1 minus p the whole power 4 because that's a first uh and construction or construction you do right and then you do the and okay now this is going to take a 0.2 0.8 0.8 0.2 family so the higher probability is going to go to 0.9936 but the lower end right hasn't de decreased by a whole lot so from 0.2 it is went to 0.1215 i 
earlier remember it went to 0 0.0064 right by the, but now it doesn't depress it that by that much what can you do then first take the or and construction follow that by an and or construction Yeah, so basically, yeah, you could do that. So now you, you have a different family of hash functions which you are now anding. And then you do an R, right? And you could do R and R and construction also, R and and R construction also. But the thing with and R, right? It, it and R pushes the uh, uh, lower limit down, and R and pushes the upper limit up. If you do an R and followed by an R and, it will still be pushing the same limit, right? So that's that's the reason we want to, want to change the Thing, right now you take this from a point to point eight, point eight, point two families which is shorter, right? So what is this family? Which what is this family that we are talking about here? Just making sure everybody is awake. Sorry, the min hash, right? The min hash family, right? So that is the one that gives you this guarantee. The min hash family you start with, and then you do this construction, then you get this. Right. Now, this is amazing, right? This is almost like your uh, uh, threshold curve, right? Step function. So, if, if the similarity is uh, greater than 0.8 or distance is less than 0.2, you have uh, probability of saying that they will have they will uh, have the same hash value. And of course, this is not quite 0, but still this is something that we can live with, okay? So, what is the cost? Nothing comes for free, right? What is the cost? How many? How many hash functions do I need here? First four, okay, first four are and then and, right? So how or and or let's do the and or right so and or is what we already did so we did 5 and followed by 20 or so we needed 100 so think of it that way right so 4 and followed by 4 or we need 16 right and then followed by 4 or and 4 and so how many 30 256. So, you need 256 hash functions now, right? So, but it's not too bad. We, we are talking about 100 earlier, but now we are just talking about 256 hash functions. So, if you can actually create 256 hash functions, and remember, we have this way of computing these hash functions effi efficiently in one pass through the data, right? So, that is not too bad. So, it is fine, but still, 256 is a lot of hash functions. So, I am not going to talk about it today. But uh, for example, if you take the Hamming distance, right? So the Hamming distance, that is a way to construct uh, uh, the basic hash family, the uh, locality sensitive hash family. But that is limited. The number of hash functions you could have is limited by the length of the the string, the length of the uh, uh, string that you are comparing with Hamming distance, right? Hamming distance. So if they are, if they differ in a particular position, then the distance is one. If they don't, it's zero, and then you sum up the distance, right? So the distance between two things. So it differs only in in, in the number of, I mean, it, the the number of different hash functions you can create is limited by the length of the string. In which case, there is a limit to how much you can amplify the hash family, right? Here it's fine because we are just looking about looking on permutation, so we have a lot of permutation to choose from, right? But uh, otherwise, uh, in some cases, you might be limited, right? <coughs> So basically, so for any curve that you want, right? So there is this fixed point in some sense, right? Any and or S curve. So you have this fixed point. So you have 1 minus 1 minus t power r power b equal to t, right? This is what we already talked about. Above t, high probabilities are increased. Below t, low probabilities are decreased. <coughs> so same thing for r and and. And as long as you you are only interested in this threshold, right? That is given by this fixed point. Right? 
then you can amplify it above and below as you want right by iterating on the R and N construction. But to make sure that you match the fundamental threshold you have to make sure the first the R and B you choose should be such that you whatever is your threshold right we talked about a threshold of 0.8 uh, so that uh, you have to make sure that your R and B can support that threshold of 0.8 right so that is basically it. So, so people are familiar with the cosine similarity. So, you can think of a point right uh, as a as a vector from from the origin right to the points location and uh, the angle the ve two vectors make right is the distance between the two points that we are interested in okay. Uh, so, the cosine of the uh, the angle is basically given by the normalized dot product and then uh, and then you can look at the r, r cos right cos inverse and that gives you the uh, distance between the two vectors. So, what do you know what, what, what are the properties of this cosine distance that uh, uh, you can think of. First thing is that it actually looks at the angle right. So, right that is origin. So, there are two points right there are two points like this right let us call them x and y I am going to call this y 1 let us say there is a y 2 so the distance between x and y 1 and x and y 2 are the same as far as cosine distance is concerned right. So, why is this a useful notion of distance? Yeah. The Euclidean distance between x and y1 and y1 and y2 could be the same, but they both are different. Uh, in this particular case, no, but go on. Uh, so, why do I want a distance metric that ignores in some sense the magnitude? Scaling and Yeah, so where would you use such distance metric? I am just asking you why is this a useful metric to have? How far one document is from another? Okay. No, you are, you are on the right track. Cosine similarity actually was proposed first by the uh, information retrieval folks. They were talking about documents. See basically what they wanted to do was they wanted to suppose there is the same uh, you know in some sense the document talks about the same topic the same keywords right. But then they just repeat them more often than the other document in some sense conceptually they expect the document to be similar. So, y1 and y2 because they have this in some sense they have the same ratio of keywords right. I mean these would be basically you know occurrences of frequencies of various keywords right the x the, the the two axes will be the frequency of different keywords right. So, since they expect if they have the same ratio right the same slope right they expect them to have the same topic topical content. So, they did not want to distinguish between y 1 and y 2 while comparing with something like x which obviously is talking about something different because it has a different content. So, all they wanted to look at was this uh, uh, you know uh, the angle between the vectors. And so, they have this whole theory about how this cosine similarity or uh, uh, the cosine distance <coughs> right uh, is, is the right way to look at this if you want to capture semantic information right. And then what happens? So, why do not why do not people use this as a notion of semantic distance anymore? People came up with all kinds of this latent variable modeling at some point right. So, they just said oh I am going to take all of these texts and other things I am going to project it into some 
you know some vector space by doing all kinds of crazy nonlinear transformations, right? I'm not. We don't have the time to get into all of those things that people do. But the crucial thing is in that vector space, Euclidean distance was fine for looking at similarity, right? Even though they were trying to talk about conceptual similarity in that vector space, Euclidean distance seemed to work very good. In fact, it's it's crazy. So the projections nowadays allow you to do arithmetic in that space. So you can add, uh, you know, king, right? And 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 the word, the, the the representation for king and the word for woman, and you get up get a point in space which happens to be the representation for queen. So you can do arithmetic in that uh, that space, and and still things seem to you know hang together, right? And it's not clear to me whether it was serendipitous, and these are examples that are cherry picked, or is there something really deep that happens? But with all the hype that is going around, nobody seems to care about these things, right. So, anyway, so getting back to uh, cosine distance, right. So, this is this is basically the cosine similarity of the cosine distance. Now, the goal is, <coughs> right, I want to design a, uh, a LSH family for points in space or vectors, right, uh, compared uh, using cosine distance, right. So, I can basically come up with a d1, d2. <coughs> Right, d1, d2 are my distance uh, uh, thresholds, and 1 minus d1 by 180, <coughs> and 1 minus d2 by 180 sensitive family. Right. So what does it mean? If the distance is between two vectors is less than d1, then with a probability at least 1 minus d1 by 100, I would say that uh, d1 by 180. Sorry, I would say that the vectors are similar right the hash functions would be similar and if they are at least d2 apart then with utmost probability 1 minus d2 by 180 i would say that their hash functions are similar so that's basically what we are asking for right and it's uh, this technique is called random hyperplanes actually this leads to a, a very interesting uh, idea called uh, sketching as well right i don't know have you looked did you look at sketching already not sure. Sorry. You just had a sketch of sketching. Huh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I, I, I'm also not going to go into the entire properties of it. I'm going to tell you how sketching comes about from locality sensitive hashing, right? So how you how you talk about sketches of points from from this LSH idea, right? So. <coughs> oh, I need. Okay. So the idea is something like this, right? So I have, I have two vectors x and y. Okay, I'll pick a random hyperplane. Right? This dotted, uh, this dashed line is a hyperplane that intersects the plane of x, y at that dashed line, right? So the dashed line shows you the intersection of this. Right? <coughs> now, if you look at the projection of, so, so so basically the idea is this, right? If x and y happen to be on two different sides of the hyperplane. Then they are going to have different signs in the projection, right? So I'm going to say uh, h of x is not equal to h of y if they are on different sides of the hyperplane, right? And uh, if they happen to be on the same side of the hyperplane as in the blue case here, right? The sign of h of x and h of y will be the same. Projection, projection of x on the hyperplane and projection of y on the hyperplane will be the same. The sign would be the same, right? Whether it is both positive or both negative. Right, the sign would be the same, and I would say the hash is the same. Okay, so this is the basic idea. So I pick a random hyperplane, I project x onto the hyperplane, I project y onto the hyperplane. I'm not interested in the actual projection; I'm only interested in the sign. Right? If they have opposite signs, I say the hashes are different. If they have the same sign, I'll say the hashes are the same. Right? So the claim is, right, for each vector. Right. I am going to say there are only two buckets H, hxv is plus 1 if vx is greater than 0, H, hxv is minus 1 if vx is less than 0. Right. So the claim is the probability that the two are going to hash right into the same bucket is 1 minus the angle between xy divided by 180. <coughs> okay. 
So, one thing that I want to make clear is that when we are talking when we are measuring the angle between x and y we are going to limit it to 180 it is not like 360 if you, if you start going the other way if you go beyond 180 it is going to be the flip side right. So, it is we are going to limit it between 0 and 180 0 they are lying in the same direction 180 they are going in the opposite directions ok. So, if I am going to select a random hyperplane right in some orientation so I basically have 180 degrees that I can sweep ok totally I can sweep. 180 degrees right. So, what fraction of that total space that I can sample from will I get a hyperplane in which the hash functions will disagree theta is it clear. So, angle between x and y is theta. So, if I get a hyperplane that is going to pass through when the projection is going to pass through that theta angle then the signs will be different right. Total plane that I can sweep is 180 degrees. So, for theta I will get a different hash right. So, 1 minus theta by 180 I will get the same hash. So, I am randomly selecting a hyperplane right. So, 1 minus theta by 180 will be the probability that hx will agree with hy. So, that is basically the number of the probability of me sampling a blue line. So, will taking the hyperplane will the probability of two vectors x and y in the same subject if they are very similar? Sorry? So, uh, we are just taking one hyperplane, right? No, no, we are just saying see one hyperplane the probability that it will be there is equal to that, right? But we do not. So, we have to take multiple hyperplanes just like we did with the min hashing thing. So, with one one permutation we cannot say anything. So, we have to take many many different permutations and then we have to figure out how we are. So, likewise, so this gives me a family of hash functions each one of each hyperplane I choose is going to define one hash function right. The thing with this hash function is it is either a plus one or a minus one right <coughs> ok there you go it is there here right. So, it is either a plus one or a minus one and with that itself I am telling you that I have this so what was the original guarantee that I wanted to give right. So, d 1 d 2 1 minus d 1 by 180 and 1 minus d 2 by 180 right. this is not very different from our min hashing case right. You remember the min hashing case what did we say t 1 d 2 1 minus d 1 1 minus d 2 huh? right I mean so d 1 d 2 p 1 p 2 the p 1 was 1 minus d 1 and p 2 was 1 minus d 2 that is where we started right. So, just like that now I have d 1 d 2 instead of 1 minus d 1 I have 1 minus d 1 by 180 because d 1 is not is not no longer ranging between 0 and 1 right. In the min hash case d 1 was between 0 and 1 <coughs> right. The Jacquard similarity was between 0 and 1 right Jacquard, Jacquard distance. Now, cosine similarity can run between 0 and 180. All I have done is divided by 180 to normalize that. So, that 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 lies between 0 and 1 correct. So, it is basically the same thing as min hashing except that I have normalized the distance. So, that I can uh, use it for defining my probability. So, that is basically it. So, exactly how you did use min hashing right. So, in min hashing each permutation of the signature uh, matrix will give you 1 or not uh, one hash right. So, basically that that is that is a family that we picked likewise each hyperplane is going to give you one hash and therefore, you go ahead with it right. So, in, in fact, this uh, the signature what did we do we basically wrote down the actual min hash value right. So, that was what the signature matrix was. So, likewise what are you going to write down here? the plus 1 or minus 1 right. If you look at the signature matrix corresponding to this random hyperplane case sorry I had to flip through all of these. So, I am going to get plus 1s or minus 1s in my signature matrix. So, depending on how many hyperplanes I choose that many rows I would have and each of those is going to be a plus or minus 1 right. So, that is essentially a sketch. Right. 
so this is this is the idea behind roughly the idea behind sketching right so basically your now your hash function becomes a, a, a sequence of plus ones or minus one so plus one if the signs agree minus one if the signs do not agree on the projection to the uh, uh, actually it is a sign of the projection to the uh, uh, hyperplane right so that is basically what it is and now if two vectors agree on the projection on many 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 different random hyperplanes then with a high probability they are going to be similar right if they do not agree on a good fraction of the random hyperplane projection then they are likely to be dissimilar okay right so i am not going to do the amplification here right you guys can do that yourself right so we can do and or or and all those constructions you can do the same thing here so you can break it into five bands of right the, uh, 10 hyperplanes each and then do an or and construction to get uh, something uh, bigger right in fact it turns out you can do something even more uh, more clever right remember i'm only interested in the sign right i'm not interested in the absolute <laughs> magnitude of my vectors right so what i can do is it turns out that i can take the take vectors of the same size as the space i'm embedded in suppose i have some large p dimensional vector space I can take a p dimensional vector where I am randomly selecting each component to be a plus 1 or a minus 1. So, I am randomly selecting each component of this vector to be a plus 1 or a minus 1. Okay? And so, then for every, every such random unique random selection, I will have one hash function. Okay? Why is this useful? It turns out computing the sign of the inner product is very easy. So, wherever there is a plus 1 in my random vector, I add that component of x wherever there is a minus 1 in my random vector I subtract that component of x right and the finally the total sum right if it is positive then it is a plus 1 if it is negative then it is a minus 1. So, computing the hash value is very easy I do not have to do any multiplication right. So, so that makes it that makes this hash function pr pretty uh, nice to compute the only challenge is if I do only plus or minus 1s so what, what is the problem? Well, if I had chosen random vectors, right? I have a lot of different random directions to choose from. But if I'm saying I'm going to do only plus or minus one, then I have only two power p possible hash functions. Where p is the dimension, right? I only have two power p possible hash functions. So if p is small, right, four or five dimensional space, then I don't have enough hash functions in the family for me to amplify. Right? So if p is really large, right? So that, that that's why I mean. In talking typically this uh, cosine similarity is used for documents right. So, document dimensions will be like 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 dimensional vectors right and there this is more than enough just doing plus or minus 1 is more than enough right and, and you save a lot uh, in terms of computation time because you are just doing uh, uh, additions and subtractions and you are not doing any multiplications ok. So, that is that is basically the last slide I have. So, we are early, so please ask questions. So, we have I mean for L2 and L1 we do, I am not sure about L infinity, I am not sure about L infinity, I will have to check, I am not sure about L infinity, uh, but L2 and L1 we have uh, hash families, it is just that the, the L2 family, in, yeah. Yeah, L2 is not too complicated, just that the analysis is painful. So, I just wanted to <laughs> show that it is actually. Huh? I have not, I have to check, I am not sure. I have not come across uh, hash families for L infinity. Maybe there is something, but uh, that would be interesting. So, one thing to remember, right? So, all the metrics that we talked about today, both the metrics at least we talked about today are non Euclidean, right? So, what is the thing with non Euclidean uh, uh, distance? Typically, when you take an average, right, when you are talking about non Euclidean spaces, the average really does not make too much of a sense, right. So, for example, I can measure uh, distances between uh, uh, vectors where I say that the components are integers, right. And then when I try to find the midpoint of two such vectors, those components do not have to be integers. So, so that means it might not exist in the space from which I am actually 
taking points and doing the uh, mean, right? But in typically most Euclidean uh, dimensions, it will be all fine, right? And likewise, in uh, that sets, right? There's no notion of this kind of averaging or uh, comparing of sets, right? You can look at distances, but uh, there's no notion of an average of a set. Two sets, I can't take two sets and do the averaging. So those kinds of uh, processing you can't do uh, in these spaces, but still you can do all this near neighbor computation and all that. So if you're looking at Hamming distance, right? It's Hamming distance, uh, the the way you define a the very simple hash function you can define, right? Each bit or each position in the string is a hash function. They agree. Hamming is on any strings, any 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 bit strings or even non-bit strings you can define. So the the definition is if uh, um, if they disagree on a bit, right, on a position, if they disagree, then the distance is one. If they agree, the distance is zero, and then the max distance is the, the number of positions in the bit, right? So you just sum up finally. So so. The distance between 111 and 000 is uh, 3. Right. So that is basically the, the Hamming distance and uh, so the hash function for that is to compare it on each bit. Right. If the first position they are the same, then you say the hash is the same and the, the second position if they are same, then you say the hash is the same. Now you can do your AND OR construction with these right? and then you can do this amplification. But the problem with this is like I mentioned earlier. Uh, so you you can see why this is a right. So if they if they disagree on on a position, then you say that okay, Hamming distance is I mean the probability that they are within a certain distance, right? So that's what you are looking at. We are not looking at identical strings here. We are looking at two strings that are within a distance of 0.8. So what does it mean? That they can agree uh, on 80 percent of the positions and they can disagree on up to 20 percent of the positions, right. We say that uh, their uh, similarity is 0.8 or higher, right. So if I am going to take each position and then compare whether they agree or not, okay, because we are assuming the distance is 0.8 or the similarity is 0.8, that means with the probability of 0.8, I will pick a position on which they agree. Right? With the probability of 0.2, I will pick a position on which they do not agree. That basically gives me the same guarantee that I had earlier. So if d1, d2, then I will have 1 minus d1, 1 minus d2 family, right. But the problem with this family, so you get that, right? Oops. Okay. So this is the Hamming distance. So I'll sum on all the bits, right? If they all the positions in the string, and if they agree, then it's a one. If they don't agree, it's a zero. Okay. So this is the indicator function, right? So that's basically it. Now my hi of x, right, uh, is equal to xi. Oops. So that is my hash function. So the probability that hxi, hix will be equal to hiy is equal to, uh, well, that is what the distance, whatever it should be, n minus that should be the distance, right. Um, yeah, so probability hix will be equal to hiy is, is equal to the the similarity of x and y and from there you can amplify it but the problem is you have only n such hash functions so you can't amplify it arbitrarily okay so yep 
no further questions we can stop here